On September 17, 1787, our founding fathers signed a new document called the Constitution. This document was meant to protect the people from the government. The founding fathers was fighting British tyranny, therefore they made sure to write it in a way that it would not become an outline for how the government would rule the people. It was revolutionary because this was the first time that a country was ruled by the people and not by either a dictatorship or a monarchy. 235 years later, this document is still the foundation of our government, but I believe we have lost sight of why they wrote the constitution and how it was meant to protect our rights. So in this video, we will refresh our memory of how important the constitution is to our country and our everyday lives. Uh, we uh, do a much, we've done a much better job for the most part, although I've spent a lot of time uh, talking about how we don't pay attention to it, uh, because of course it is a piece of paper, and people have to believe in it, and they have to pay attention to it. The People's Republic of China has a constitution. Uh, the People's Republic of China guarantees freedom of speech. Uh, they guarantee uh, freedom of religion. They do all that. And um, so, did the, uh, so did the Soviet Union. The uh, Soviet Union promised all those things that we find in our Constitution as well. So uh, the Constitution is only as good as the people are at protecting uh, the um, principles and the, uh, and the freedoms that are written into it. My name is Jane. I'm Russian. Um, I was born right before the Soviet Union collapsed. So I have a bit of a memory of the Soviet Union. I remember um, I have a memory of that were passed by, on me by my parents, by my grandparents, the story of the family. I lived most of my life in, in Russia. I saw the country transforming from Soviet Union, Soviet Union collapsing, the rays of new country, the rays of freedom, and then the collapse of freedoms. I saw big hopes in the country with the new trends. I saw big hopes. I saw a lot of freedoms that were guaranteed and that were brought upon our people with, uh, in, in Russian Federation. And I saw how easily it all started fading away. The Constitution of Russian Federation guarantees pretty much the same rights as the Constitution of the United States. It's one thing to have the documents. It's a completely different story when you have the whole system that is supporting implementation of the document. The fact that you have right on the paper may, mean, may not mean anything if you live in a different country. In Russia, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of expressing our opinion, we have freedom, all of that is guaranteed by the Russian constitution, but the government managed to pass the laws that go, goes, the chipping of the rights of people guaranteed, those rights that are guaranteed by the constitution. You know that's funny, that freedom of speech, because for example, I have an ex who's a little popular and, um, you know, just like when they had the COVID and the curfew and stuff, he gets out in the media and say some stuff and they lock him up. Especially in Mexico, the cartel runs the government. There's like no, in Mexico, the way that the people, if you ask people there, there's no such thing as the government. Like, same thing, there's no lawyers out there, they're, they don't ever make any money because why? They know that they're going to lose. Why? Because the cartel pays off the jury. The cartel is literally, it, it just overgoes everything. Like, it just gets crazy to think that there's no government. Yes, there's rules. Yes, there's like, you know, um, like the constitution that's, you know, in there, but nobody follows it because why? The money overrides everything else in, in Mexico. There's no... There's nothing without the cartel. It's like the cartel literally runs everything. It's what ke it's keeping, if anything, the government in business. It's what's providing the money and the funds. Why? Because they buy out people um, in the government to protect them. 
Like, if you think about it, a lot of cartels, a lot of people don't get caught for years and decades and decades. Why? Because they have people in the government protecting them. So it's just like everything's ran by the government over there. Over there, you get pulled. Like I got pulled over. How much money do you have? And I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> and there you go, 400, 500 pesos, you're done. You're, you're gone. You're off the leash. Or if you know somebody. If you know somebody that's, you know, big stuff out there, then okay, oh, yeah, you can go, you can go. Like, what is that? What if I, like, now, what if I committed something illegal? No. There, you can maybe either, you can pay them off, you'll get a beating from the police, but there's there's no such thing. They're not going to arrest you. It's very unlikely you'll get arrested in Mexico. Very unlikely. And even then, it goes to show, like, the jails here in the United States, you know, in, in America, they're more, you know, they're they're made for punishment in Mexico. You can smoke in there. You can you can have mattresses that your family brings you from outside. Your family can, if your mother decides to visit you in jail every single day, she can bring you a hot cooked meal every single day. You don't see that here in the United States. <laughs> Why? You wow. know what I'm saying? Like it's just a lot of things that you go to see. Like wow, like the government's very different different countries, and it's crazy to see that in Mexico. Not all the time. Yeah. Not I, all the time. Yeah. If I will go into politics. It would be to change things for children, for mm -hmm. you know, the poor, the wealthy, just yeah. to be equal. Yeah, I feel like there's some people that go into the government wanting to actually make a change that is fair to everyone or things that would actually benefit the world or the people rather than just craving power. But I do believe there are certain people that do go in there just to, to say that they have, they, they have power. Okay. Absolutely. Humans do crave power, just like they desire money, they desire status, fame. Um, ultimately, humans desire power. See, people want to have control over others even if there's no gain. And just like money, power has the same ability. It gets you what you want. Not just in elections and when people want to run for office, but just the fact if someone's in a position of authority, or uh, they put themselves in those positions because they know they can ex exert some type of control, whether it's office, um, being an owner, you know, control a, controlling of a corporation or a business or even uh, police officers or uh, correctional guard, uh, correctional center guards, you know, from the prisons. Uh. I think humans will always crave power. You know, they're, uh, it's, it's just a human instinct. They want to be able to control their own destiny and and uh, the things that they're able to, to, uh, to do, uh, to uh, acquire, um, th even their own survival. Uh, so yeah, they'll crave power like that. Uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, the ones that want to utilize that power over someone else that now starts to infringe on their rights and therefore they become a, a, a danger, a tyrant almost. Absolutely. Not all laws that are written in the Stone Ages make sense in today's world. We have grown, we have evolved as a people, as a nation, in society. Um, there will always be circumstances. I mean, take the pandemic, for example, right? We had to do a lot of things differently. We had to stay six feet apart. It became a law, right? That was why, good intention or just because it was a law. We had to make changes for the better intention. So good intention should always go over law. Not always. You, I mean, on the, on the surface, you can say, yes, good intentions are better than you know, written laws. But at the same time, um, to achieve those good intentions, you may want to do something bad to people because may, you may say that, um, executing this person you know i have good intentions because i'm trying to keep them from committing crimes or you know from robbing people doing this or that to people so i'm you know they're they will interpret it in, in their own way and it'll just lead to harming the people more than it would you know with their good intentions so it would be nice if there would be a combination of both of those yeah but sometimes when people do have good intentions things still end up spiraling wrongly or the wrong decisions end up being ends up being the outcome even though the intention was good not more important like if there's a situation where somebody needs to speed to get to the hospital um, you know I 
I feel like the cop sh- could give a ticket. But I feel like it's situational. In that situation, they could, you know, stop them. Hey, my wife's in labor. Oh, okay, you know, let's go get you to the hospital. So it's good intentions, but you're also breaking the law. Uh, written law is something that everyone can see, uh, uh, understand, and, and know that everyone has to comply with that. Good intentions, uh, what I think are good, could be completely different than what you think are good. And uh, now when we start having uh, that type of uh, um, discretion if you want to call it that that one person can say well I don't think you should be able to do this or that uh, then uh, now it may infringe on that other person's rights so no written law is what uh, collectively as a as a people as a country we've decided is uh, uh, acceptable it's been put in through the legislature people that we had elected to go there and represent us and uh, we all should be in compliance with that You know, the Bill of Rights is probably best summed up with this uh, quote of uh, Ayn Rand. And uh, the, uh, the smallest uh, minority in the world is the individual. And if you do not support individual rights, you do not support minority rights. And I suspect that that's, that's as good a statement as any about what these are about. You know, it's, it's, not, about, it's not about your rights. It's about my rights. Uh, and, of course, there's limits, uh, there's limits on all of them. It's got to do with something called the social compact, which is, um, which is the underpinning of uh, both the Declaration and the Constitution. And that is, is that we, uh, we agree that we have certain rights, but we also agree that if we're going to have a civil society, um, we are going to uh, grant certain authority to the government for that purpose. And then we are also going to limit our own individual rights in recognition of the rights that you have. Uh, Frederick Bastier put it a different way, and that is is the the, um, right to extend my fist ends at the tip of your nose. That goes back to the basic uh, idea of what civil society is all about. And um, pretty much uh, John Locke, uh, and John Locke uh, with his second treatise in government was extraordinarily influential on both uh, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, although uh, Locke uh, called it uh, life, liberty, and property. I think um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness has a little bit better marketing ring to it. Uh, But in some respects, uh, pursuing property and accumulating things, being able to provide for your family is the pursuit of happiness. uh, They're they're kind of the same thing. Um, So, so, but it is about uh, protecting the rights of the individual. And in protecting the rights of the individual, the idea is, is that the individual uh, gets their rights protected, and in return, they agree to uh, agree to have the civil government exercise certain kinds of authority. And so, I guess it's a combination of the two. I guess they're not mutually uh, mutually exclusive. You know, while we're protecting individual rights, the goal is that the goal is to be able to do that and have a civil society, uh, so that we don't have the law of the jungle. The individual's rights should be just as important as a collective uh, right. The, the common good uh, may be common to people who feel that it is, but uh, it may infringe on an individual's rights. So the individual's rights should be paramount to everything. Uh, as long as they're within the Constitution and within the law, there shouldn't be any infringement on that from the government or any other group. Because then if you allow the collective to do anything to the individual, if the collective has a certain mindset that, you know, um, it's more on the evil side, then they're prone to do anything that is going to violate this person's, you know, basic human rights. Everyone should be okay to live on their own moral compass and values and belief. And if it's not the laws, then they should be okay to do what they want. Someone shouldn't be able to instill what they think on you. The Constitution is not, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. They say about, everybody talks about our democracy, etc. We don't have a democracy. 
we have a republic. Uh, and a republic, by its, by its very nature, is something that's called anti-majoritarian. Uh, it is designed to, in fact, protect the rights of minorities. And not, that, not, the, uh, not the rights of, um, of um, physical minority, uh, not the right of uh, immutable characteristics, but the rights of people to have different kinds of thinking, uh, the rights to um, uh, publish uh, different stuff and uh, have different, different speech. It, uh, that's what the, it's, um, it's the rights to have, be able to have different philosophy. Those are the anti-majoritarian functions of the Constitution because the, uh, the founders uh, found to be uh, democracy very, very da dangerous. When you have a, a government who's put together that uh, the rule is 50% plus one, then you have what they consider to be a mobocracy. And it would be the dictatorship of the majority, uh, who uh, one day would uh, say, "Okay, everybody that does that disagrees with us, you guys can't have guns, but we all can." You know, uh, that's that's democracy. Okay, that's democracy. Uh, and um, things like things are put in the Constitution to take them out of the realm of democracy, because they in fact belong to all of us, regardless of what you think about me or I think about you or uh, and so things like speech you know they, there should not be the authority of um, of a majority of the people to say that I can't talk about something it shouldn't exist uh, and so that's why the First Amendment freedom of speech exists as, uh, and to take that out of the authority of the take that away from the government of doing that so the people who say the Constitution is an old document or that it's a living document or that it's supposed it's got nothing to do with legitimate constitutional thought. It's got to do with the fact that their policy preferences are being frustrated by the provisions of the Constitution. And the provisions of the Constitution are supposed to, are supposed to make things go so that they're slow, that there's long considered public debate and so that there are some things that are out of the, out of the public sphere. Absolutely. If you're not in charge of your own government, then uh, uh, you now are oppressed in some manner, most likely, by uh, some other group, which now infringes on your rights. And if you don't have control of your own government, it has uh, control of you. So now it can dictate what you're able to do or not do, uh, what you're able to own, uh, things of that nature, about your ability to move around, travel, uh, all of those things. And the people are in fact, in charge of their own government. Um, they do that by voting, right? Um, they vote to put the elects in power, and so they are responsible for their own government, whether they believe it or not. That's why we, if we don't speak up, the people, yeah. to the government, and we don't let them know what needs to be changed, then there will be no change. Exactly. That's certainly the uh, philosophy upon which, uh, which the Constitution and, uh, was based. Uh, it's uh, kind of interesting that they had, during the uh, course of the rat ratification, they called special conventions for this so that the uh, Constitution was not ratified by state legislatures so that it was not an agreement among the states, but rather an agreement among the people. And uh, they went out of their way to see to it that uh, the people had the say so in the adoption of the Constitution rather than the established governments. I don't know that we still have uh, that situation where the people, as a practical matter, where the people are actually in charge of the government. A variety of things uh, happened that were, uh, that threw the original system out of whack. Um, one of the worst, uh, worst things that happened that threw the original system out of whack was the 17th Amendment. The 17th Amendment to the Constitution uh, changed the way senators were selected. Senators uh, originally were selected by the legislatures of the states. And then through, because of the 17th Amendment, the senators became uh, directly elected by the people. That threw out one of the biggest checks and balances on control of the federal government because 
when senators were responsible, if senators were responsible to, the, say, the folks in Springfield, and uh, they, uh, they, passed a, they passed a law in uh, D.C. that said, uh, you know, you have to, uh, you have to reduce uh, the legal limit for uh, driving and drinking and driving from 0.10 to 0.08. Uh, theoretically, the states should be able to tell them to go pound sand. Uh, there's, but, but, the senator, but now the senators are now elected and they're creatures of the federal government, so they go, okay, we're going to give you money for your streets if you do this, for your highways. And so they buy the people. But if the senators were still elected by or, or chosen by the state legislatures, they would not succumb to the uh, siren song of spending big money in Washington. Uh, the senators, you know, as a practical matter, you know, there's, what, 12 million people in Illinois? If um, you're elected by 12 million people, who do you represent? Nobody. Yeah. You don't really represent anybody. What you, who you represent are the people that give you the money, that enable you to uh, communicate, uh, vote for me, to the 12 million people. The Constitution originally was put together in, you know, with three, uh, three distinct um, service areas. The president to serve the country. The representatives, the House of Representatives, to represent individual districts, which, by the way, were only 30 or 40,000 people at the time. And then, of course, the Senate, which were supposed to be more or less ambassadors for the state governments, and the state governments themselves would fight to keep their authority out of the hands of the feds. Okay, when you made the when you made the senators directly elected, you just made them grandiose representatives. So their duty, their job at that time became to tax and spend, bring home the bacon, collect as much money in Washington as they can, and to give. And so that they can say they're giving it back to us and, and see what you're doing for us. So that was the, that was the that was the beginning of the disaster that uh, the federal government, centralized government, has become. And then what you had is because the uh, Senate is in charge of uh, approving judges. Okay, they're in charge of uh, if the president nominates a judge, then the Senate is in charge of approving judges. Well, before the Seventeenth Amendment. The, the Senate would approve judges who saw that, who were interested in keeping federal power low. And then once the Senate, senators became part of the federal establishment, they would now approve judges who would, were also in favor of collecting federal power in Washington. So they started, started passing legislation to collect more power, and then that legislation started getting approved about the time of Franklin Roosevelt uh, to uh, bring in the power to the feds. Uh, because now the judge, before, uh, when the federal government went out and stepped out of line, the judges would say, no, you're out of line and you can't do this. And so you had the judges that got approved by the Senate that were now being elected by the 17th Amendment who wanted to stay in the, in the power. They threw the whole system out of whack. And that's, those are before those judges as well. Uh, Things like um, there was the Work Progress Administration and a variety of things that FDR proposed uh, to deal with the Depression. They started uh, creating all this federal alphabet soup of agencies. And before, uh, before the 17th Amendment, the judges used to say, no, nah, you can't do that. Uh, there's, no, no, there's no authority for an agency to uh, pass, while they call it a regulation, it has the full force and effect of law. Uh, and so that... The uh, Article I, the very first phrase of the Constitution, Article I says, the legislative power shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. It didn't say in the Federal Election Commission. It didn't say in the Federal Communications Commission. It didn't say in the Federal Admi Aviation Administration. It said in a Congress of the United States. And before the 17th Amendment, all those kind of agency things were thrown out by the courts as not being allowed by the Constitution. No, the, gov the president shouldn't have absolute power. No one person in a country should have absolute power. They're going to feel like they're God. They're going to do whatever they want to do, and who's going to check them? I don't think anyone should have absolute power in, in our country. Uh, you know, it'd be like having a, a, a dictator or a tyrant or anything uh, in some, some fashion uh, if one person has all that power in their hands. 
again, you know, we have uh, three branches of the government, kind of, a, you know, the, the checks and balances aspect of that, that are to make sure that no one, no branch is able to do that uh, uh, and have a, uh, a corner of the market on, on uh, uh, power in, in this country. Uh, if, if the president chooses uh, that he uh, wants to enforce certain laws, not enforce others, and uh, that's um, creating a situation where other people's rights are being denied, um, we have to have a means to be able to, to change that. Again, through the legislature, they can pass laws to address that. Uh, the judiciary can strike down uh, cases that come about through that enforcement power and, and be able to curtail his ability to have, an, as an individual, the ultimate power. Okay, so you get the leader of the progressive movement is Woodrow Wilson, and I'm quoting him as you quote him in Relic. Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson, the president is at liberty, both in law and conscience, to be as big a man as he can. That, on your account in Relic, that's the central point of the progressive movement, a critique of congressional behavior or arrangements, and an expansion of the powers, or at least of the comportment of the presidency, correct? Well, let me put it in somewhat different words. Go. Um, what the progressives recognized at the time was that here they had this profoundly different society that was bursting at the seams and creating all sorts of problems that weren't getting dealt with, and they were trapped in a governmental system that was designed uh, more than 100 years earlier that didn't work and that had Congress at its lawmaking center. Here this Congress is totally parochial, rooted in districts and states, wide open to special interest pressures, and totally corrupt to boot. And what, Congress is going to solve these problems? I don't think so. Right? So the progressives came along and said, we want good government. Okay, how are you going to get it? Well, they did a number of things, including trying to get rid of spoils, trying to eliminate corruption, and so on. Um, but more generally, structurally, what they did was to try to shift power away from Congress and, and the party machines by creating a, an administrative state, a bureaucracy, that was rooted in expertise and merit, which any advanced nation needs to have if policies are going to be carried out effectively. So civil service reform is a big part yes, of it. Yes, that's a big right? part of it. And having a presidency that is uh, uh, the real leadership of the country in a separation of power system where presidents can't actually pass laws, right? Congress has to pass the laws. But presidents can take the lead and be a more dynamic uh, focus for uh, the energy of the nation in solving social problems. And Teddy Roosevelt was, was the real um, uh, uh, symbolic force here of progressivism. He comes and, before Woodrow and, Wilson. And then Woodrow course. Wilson follows up. Right. And it's not an accident that both Roosevelt and Wilson said, hey, you know, we need to take the lead and we will do whatever we need to do, you know, within the constraints of the law. And this was a fundamental shift in the concept of what the presidency was, what the role of the president was within the American political system. And ever since then, all modern presidents have basically adopted this concept of what the presidency is all about, Republicans and Democrats alike. Okay. Civil War. Um, I, would, I would suggest that there's way too many people who are too dedicated and too used to and too accustomed to uh, freedom that, and uh, the alternative to following the Constitution because the basic function of the Constitution is to limit the government. So presuming we do not follow the Constitution, the alternative is unlimited government and there will be people that will not submit to unlimited government. It's, um, it's extraordinarily, it would be an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And um, that's, you know, they, of course, uh, that goes back to uh, um, Abraham Lincoln is, is the one that uh, indicated that, um, of course, uh, America would never be uh, conquered from the outside. It would only be conquered from the inside if we allowed ourselves to be, you know. And uh, that sometimes looks like the danger we're in at the moment. Uh, that does uh, appear to be the danger that we're in at the moment. I, 
David Keith Mercer, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. As a retired military veteran, I raised my hand voluntarily and swore an oath because I believed in the foundations of the Constitution. Military veterans never volunteered to go to war for Congress. The Vietnam veterans that are represented by each one of these 1500 flags died for the core concepts of what our Constitution represents. Men are created equal. Every person has the right to express their opinion, and more importantly, as a nation we have the right to govern ourselves free from oppression. I hope this video showed that even though we may not have the same idea of how to govern, we all believe that we should have the freedom to express how we should be governed. So on September 17th, take a look at the Constitution to remind yourself the freedoms that the Constitution protects. Or otherwise, sometime in the future, you may end up losing those freedoms that we all cherish.